And a few weeks ago, I, I was speaking in a, in a church out of town, and I spent Saturday morning with my wife training their leaders, and then we spoke in their church on Sunday morning. And when I was, I was getting ready to go, I was working on some stuff for the leadership session, and the, God dropped a question in my heart. I started working on it as a training session, and I just kept feeling like I was supposed to speak it on Sunday at their church, which I did. And so I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to speak it to you this morning, too. So it, it's not really uh, in a series. It'll kind of launch our series, which will start next week, brand new series called Jesus Will. And it's going to be a, an awesome series. It might be one of the best we've ever done. So don't miss that. That starts next week. I was going to talk about what Jesus, what Jesus will do. We're going to talk over the next few weeks that he'll be worshipped, he'll be shared, he'll be preached, and he will be returning. So uh, we'll talk about that next few weeks. But um, this morning, so uh, the title this morning is The DNA of a Jesus Culture. Culture is, is the belief systems, it's the way that you do life. And so the DNA that's in a culture is important. And we can say we love Jesus, we can say we're a great church, but, but it has to be in our DNA. And so I, I want to unpack this this morning, and I will get to the question that I felt like God dropped in my heart. And I believe you're going to hear some different things this morning that will set you free. I believe that over the next few moments. So Matthew chapter 16 We're going to start in verse 13. It's kind of a familiar passage of scripture. So here we go. Y'all ready? Everybody say this. Say, I will not sit here and silently let this message go by. Say, I will receive it. I will say amen. I will be fired up. Okay, here we go. I said fired. I don't fired up. No, fired up. That's different. than. Here we go. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13. Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he's, he asked his disciples, he said, who do people say I am? Who do they say that the Son of Man is? So they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah. Others say that you're Jeremiah, or you're one of the prophets. Jesus said, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, and he said, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, and he said to him, you're blessed, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. So Jesus is with his team, and they've been ministering, and they've been reaching people, and his popularity is growing, and and Jesus turns to his team, and he said, hey, what do the polls say? What do the surveys say? What's the the rumor? Who, Who do people say I am? And they said, well, you know, the, the trend is that you're, 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 you're a prophet. You, you might be Elijah, maybe John the Baptist. And so Jesus looked and he said, but who do you guys say I am? Who, who do you know me to be? And Simon spoke up and he said, you're the Christ. You're God's son. And Jesus said something to him. He said, you didn't get this in your own reasoning. This didn't come from, from in you know, flesh and blood. He said, but God revealed this to you. And so we always, we always make some life points, and so here's the first one is this, is that confession always determines positioning. Your confession always determines your position. So Jesus is saying, hey, who, what's, what's the poll say? Who am I? What are they saying? And then Jesus turns like he would to each and every one of us and says, that's what is the rumor, that's what is trending, but who do you specifically and individually claim that I am? See, it's important that you know who he is. Your confession means everything. It determines your position. See, I I could sit down with you and talk for a few moments, and I would have found out your political positioning. I could sit down with you for a few moments. I'd find out what you believe about making money. I would find out what you believe uh, 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 about health care. I would find out what you believe about your, your favorite sports team. I would just find out your position on things by just talking to you. So our confession is important. And, and here's the thing that Jesus was recognizing with Peter. He said this, and Peter said, you're the son of God. You're, the, you're God's only son. And, and Jesus said, you didn't get that on your own. Right. And our confession is essential, and, and here's why. According to Scripture, your confession is what you have to stand on. It's what you have to hold on to. The Bible says, hold on to your confession of your faith. So what you're holding on to and what you're standing on in a time of trial, in a time of trouble, in a world that's a little crazy right now, what you're standing on and what you're holding on to had better be accurate. And what is confession? Confession is just the confirmation of the revelation that you've believed. It's the confirmation of the revelation that you have believed. Now, how many of you maybe spent some years in church, been taught some things that maybe later you found out were, were a little bit inaccurate? 
But see, all of those years, that was the confession and the revelation that you had to stand on. You might have spent some years n- never understanding that God wanted to prosper you and bless you. You might have spent some years not understanding that God wanted you healed, that God wanted you free, that God wanted you delivered, that God wanted you to thrive, that God wanted you to overcome. And if you spent some years confessing the wrong things, because that's all the revelation that you might have had. But that's why the Bible says when you know the truth, it actually sets you free on another level. Because when you know the truth, the truth has this ability to do what? Set you free. And whom the Son has set free, they are actually free indeed, the Bible says. So your confession comes from your revelation. And, And the biblical word for revelation is an interesting word because what it means is there's something, and it's always been there, but there was a curtain in front of it, or there was a lid on it. So it's not like Jesus just came up with something, but there is truth and there is revelation there that you might have spent your whole life not knowing was there. You might have sat in church every week and not knowing it was there until somebody opened the word of God and the curtains opened and the lid came off and you had what I call an aha moment. Aha, I get it. That's good. That's grace. That's faith. That'll set me free from where I've been living. That'll set me free from the level that I've been on. It's called revelation. The lid's taken off is what it means. So the goodness of God's always been there. The healing power of God's always been there. The blessing of God's always been there. The freedom of God's always been there. The delivery, it's always been there, but someone had to take the lid off and open the curtains. And you got revelation. And when you got revelation on the goodness of God, you confirm it with your confession. So you might have spent some years saying the wrong things. And whatever you say is what you have to stand on. If you believe that your life is just about luck, that's all you got to stand on. If you believe that God does bad things to people to teach them lessons, then that's what you've got to stand on. But when you believe accurately, because that stuff's inaccurate, when you believe right, revelation, the lid's off, and now that's what you've got to stand on. Your confession confirms your revelation, so your confession always puts you in a position where it locates you. So that's why our confession, our information, it needs to be accurate. Amen. So when your information is accurate, how many know your confession is accurate? And if your confession is accurate, it puts you on a level to walk in the victory God's called you to walk in. So Jesus was asking a question. Okay, you guys have been around me. You know what everyone's saying. But what do you have revelation on? And Peter had revelation. You're God's son. You are who you say you are. You came and did what you said you came to do. And you, you, I can have what you say I can have. That was his revelation. And God said, you didn't get that from reasoning. You didn't get that from a textbook. You didn't get that from some bad teaching. You got that from the heart of God. So our confession, it will locate us. It's what we have to stand on. And really what it did for Peter is it separated him and it identified him and it, it, it put him in a position to be called a Christ follower. And that's what the goodness of God does. It will identify us. It will separate us. It will call us a Christ follower. And it will bring a separation from the rest of the world and from religion. It will separate us. It will give us a brand new identity when we understand who God is and who we are in God. Verse number, verse number 18. And so in this context of conversation, I like what Jesus says. He, he says, and. You got that from God. Your confession is important, is accurate, and, look what he says, and I also say to you, you're Peter. Now, this is important because just a moment ago, Jesus called him Simon Bar-Jonah. Well, how many know what's in a name is important? So Bar-Jonah is basically his father's name, which would be his last name, so to speak, his given name. But the word Simon, if you remember when Jesus called Peter, he changed his name because he was, he was called what? Simon. Now, Simon, if you look up that name, it means leafy or flaky. And Jesus said, I'm going to change your name. First thing, how many know when Jesus met you, he had to change your identity. You might have been leafy, you might have been flaky, you might have been addict, you might have been depressed, you might have been suicidal, you might have been broke. Jesus needed to change your identity. And so Jesus looks and he says, Simon Barjona, God gave you this revelation. And Peter? See how he changed his name? Because Peter means a big, large piece of rock. So he changed his existence from leafy and flaky to big piece of rock. That's what God can do for you. If you're watching my live stream in this service, that's what God can do for you. He can change things about you. So he changed his name to Peter, and he said, Peter, um, he he said, upon this rock, I'm going to, look what it says, I'm going to build my church 
and all of hell itself will not prevail. Now, he wasn't building the church on Peter. What he was saying was, those who have a confession as accurate as Peter's, upon them I'm going to build my church. The word rock here means a huge rock. So what he's saying is, everyone who has made that confession, God has rocked their life solidified what was leafy and flaky and changed their existence. And upon those confessions, we're going to plant on a rock. And he said, I'm going to build, and he uses this word, I'm going to build my church. Kind of a new word, I'm going to build my church. It was a Greek word that was familiar, but, but let me give you the second point. So if our confession determines our positioning, the church always determines our placement. The church always determines our placement. How many know the church is a big deal to Jesus? That's what he's speaking about here. He said, I'm going to build my church. First of all, whose church is it? Who's going to build it? He's going to build it. See, when we try to build it, we just get in the way. There's a lot of pastors that want to build their church. What's his church? He'll build the church if we do this thing the right way. But he said, I'm going to build my church. That that word is the Greek word ecclesia. And it it you might hear some people say it means to be called out and gather. That's too weak of a phrase. It means to be called out and connect together or, or gather together, but it's, it's a lot different than we would think because we, we think, well, church is this little huddle we come to and we escape the world and we're just a hospital for everybody who's hurting. That is not what, that's not what church means. Church meant there was, a, there was a political system in Rome that was suppressing people. There was Jewish traditions that were not helping people and, and there, was, there, was, there, was, there was great oppression on the people, there were theories and philosophies and, and all these things were failing people. And, and so what Jesus said, I'm gonna build a called out ecclesia of people who will not be under that political system and they'll not be under that religious traditional system and they're gonna identify themselves differently and they're gonna have a different purpose, they're gonna have a different lifestyle, they're gonna have a different pursuit in their life. These are the people Jesus called and he said, this, this is a new identity of people, I call them my kingdom people. So what, what, what Jesus was saying, these are people who have come out of a system of the world and religion into a new kingdom. They were translated into a new kingdom. And Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And we, we understand that the Bible says this, that he'll build his church, so he's building it. And he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against when he builds a church. See, a church that Jesus built, hell can't stop. Did you get that? A church he builds, hell can't stop. And he said, the, I like this, he said, the gates of hell, so it gives the idea that the church should be what? Advancing. So the, the local, so there's the universal church, and then there's what we would call the local church, which is a church that has expression in a local community. So it's a community of faith in, 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 a, certain, in a certain area. So what Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my universal church, it's going to have local um, uh, outlets or local aspects, or, or it's going to look differently in some places, but my kingdom's going to operate through the church. And Jesus, I'm going to build that church, and a church that Jesus builds is going to be on the offense, so much so that the gates of hell cannot defend against the church. So the church should be progressing, it should be taking ground, it should be growing. So God started dealing with me about something, because, you know, a lot of times we, we get caught up in, in numbers, and, and how big things are or could be. And numbers are important. I mean, there's a whole book in the Bible about numbers. And so numbers are important. But how many know we need to be more concerned with health? Because a healthy thing always what? Grows. If your business is healthy, it's going to grow. If your marriage is healthy, it's going to grow. If a church is healthy, it's going to grow. If you're healthy, you're going to so health is the most important thing. And, and so I, I, we want to talk about that as we unfold this here. So what are we saying? We're saying that your confession always reveals your position, and church always reveals your placement. Now, can, can we build on this for a moment? I have said this before. I haven't said it for a while, but, uh, you know, when I, when I was in Ohio teaching uh, that church, it was easy to say some things because I was leaving in, in a few hours. And it was easy to say things. Actually, the pastor told me after the sermon, he goes, you, you, you set me free from something this morning. And so um, it's a little bit different saying this to people that I see every week, but I believe that each and every one of you sitting here watching on live stream, there are three things you need in your life. Whether you know that you need them or not, you need these three things. One is a savior that you can surrender to. A savior that you can toss the keys to your life and say, be the boss of my life. Be the savior of my life. You need that. I need that. Everyone needs a savior. How many would agree with that? You need a savior. 
How, how many know on your own you jacked it up pretty good? You, you need a Savior. Anyone glad you got a Savior? And we all understand that one. Not only do you need a Savior to surrender to, you need a pastor to submit to. You need a church to connect to. Now let me focus on that second one. The reason why I say it's different because I have to talk about myself for just a moment. But, but God, God puts men and women in leadership and he delegates authority to them. And so when God places us in churches, he does it for a reason, and he puts people there to, to, to speak into our lives and to, to lead us, to direct us. And l- let me read you a scripture. It's, it's not on the screen here, but in Jeremiah chapter 23, um, I, I want to share something with you why it's so important to not only be surrendered to God, but to be in a church and to be under a leadership. Jeremiah 23, first few verses. Oh, was that on the screen? Oh, it is on the screen. Okay. So look at this first word, whoa. What happens when you hear the word whoa? Your kid's about to run out in the street and when you yell, whoa, 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 whoa. What? Attention, like stop. So look what the Bible says. Woe to shepherds, it's another word for pastors, who destroy and they scatter the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, the Lord says this. The Lord God of Israel is against those shepherds who feed my people, and he says, you've scattered my flock, you've driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings. But, aren't you glad there's a but there? I'm going to gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where they've been driven. I'm going to bring them back to their folds, and they will be fruitful, and they will increase. I will set up shepherds or pastors over them who will feed them. They will fear no more. They will be dismayed no more, and there shall be no more lacking. Well, we see in this scripture, the number one sign of a false shepherd is they scatter people. It says it right here. They scatter people, and then they stop attending to them. The number one sign of a false shepherd is they will scatter people. When they start scattering people, they're, they're attend- and then they stop attending to those people, and then those people that have scattered with them, their lives fall apart. We, I've seen it over and over. It's horrible. And so the Bible says that's a false shepherd, But a real shepherd, the Bible says, and the Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 3. He says, in the last days, I'm going to give pastors who have my heart. So what I think God is doing in this hour is he's getting his church healthy. And he's getting some healthy leadership because he's going to do a big growth season, a harvest season. His his blessing is going to be very evident on the church in this season. And so he said this. He said, I'm going to give pastors pastors who have my heart that won't scatter people, but it says here if you have the right pastor teaching and speaking and directing and leading your life, look at the three results. You would pay big bucks for these three results. One, it says they will drive out fear. They will drive fear off of people. Uh, What's the prevailing number one thing happening in the world right now? It's a spirit of fear and and torment. Now, if you remember a couple years ago, if you were here at that time, when the economy started to tank, um, how many remember this? I walked up here, and I said, you know, the economy, things are getting worse, and the economics, I I said, here's what we need to do, church. We need to give more than we've ever given. And I actually said this from this pulpit. I said, and go shop. How many were here? The ladies, like, revival broke out with the ladies. I mean, they were, they were all of marshals before service was over. I know the reason why I said that is don't let the world dictate your giving and break that spirit of poverty. Break that. It, it, and so it drives, uh, when we speak the word of God, it's going to drive fear out of your life. If you were here a few weeks ago when everything was going crazy right before the elections, I walked up here and I said, the best hour for the church is coming. I said, don't believe in the fear. Don't believe in the, because what is fear? The devil's a liar, and he'll deceive you. He'll get you into doubt. He'll get you into fear. He'll talk you out of your healing. He'll talk you out of your blessing. He'll steal your lunch, and he'll blame God for it. But we're not in that, we're not in that world. That's not, we don't take our cues. Just to let you know, the, the polls might be wrong. Did we not learn that the last few days? I mean, my, my point to saying that is we're told things and we buy into them. You, the devil tells you things you bought into it. And so I walked up here and I said, don't buy into the fear that's in the world. Don't buy into the churches, you know, in bad shape. Don't buy into that stuff. Why? Because I wanted to break fear off of your life. The word of God is the book of faith. Where there's faith, there's no room for what? Fear. So 
So one thing that happens when, when you're under the right leadership is fear is broken off. The second thing the Bible says is dis, dismay is broken off. What's dismay? Dismay is an, uh, distress is another word. How many of there's a lot of distress in life? Well, when we teach the word and we reveal the word and we bring the word to you and a right pastor's teaching you and you're, you're surrendered to God and you're submitted under the right word in the right place, it, it breaks distress off your life. Stress can be around you, but it don't have to get in you. It, 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 it can be around you, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to own it. And then the last thing it says, the other thing it breaks off of you, the Bible says this, is, is lack. How many like to have some lack broke off of you? Well, hang around in the right place. Lack could be anything. It, 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 it could be sickness and disease because you lack health. It could be poverty because you lack resources. Getting in the right place, under the right word, being taught the right things, being submitted in the right place, what will it do? It'll break stress off your life. It'll break lack off of your life. You'll have an answer, you have a solution. It'll break fear off your life. If you're submitted in the right, now you can come and sit and never be, uh, never be submitted and hear some good things and feel good when you leave, but how many know you, you can leave and God didn't just build us for Sundays, he built us for 24-7. Now, now, I realize that, that when I preach that, I'm talking about myself as part of his leadership. I don't want to just sound like I'm being arrogant to you, but, but I want you to be healthy. So Jesus said, he said this, your confession is going to locate you, is going to position you. The local church is going to place you. And there's another one I'm going to get to in just a moment. But in that placement, get in the right place. Whether it's here, if it's not here, get in a good place where the word of God is changing you. It's Because my job, you know what my job is? Is to feed you, is to lead you, and tend to you. Tend means to protect you. Lead means to guide you. And feed you means I give you the word of God. And it says I do that to equip you to walk with God and do the work of the ministry. Well, we just want to pay you to do the work. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, I equip you to walk this out, walk your faith out, and do the work of the ministry. Is what. So you're called to minister. Let me know it's good stuff. Okay, so let, let, let's go to the last thing. So Jesus said, and, I'm going to build my church. And then he says, and again. He says, and, don't you like the ands Jesus puts in there? Oh, 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 here, your confession is going to locate you, and I'm going to build my church on that confession. Oh, and by the way, guess what he's going to do? I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It just gets better and better. Right confession, right placement, right church, right position. Now he gets to it, and he says this. I'm going to give you the keys of, not to the kingdom. I mean, if you just get the keys to something, you might get in, but you don't know how to operate it. He said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever will be loosed on earth will be loosed what? In heaven. So confession determines position, church determines placement, and kingdom always determines power. What's the Bible said? The kingdom is, is about power. Did it not say that? It said it's about joy, peace, righteousness, and power in the Holy Spirit. Come on, y'all awake? I'm telling you, the, 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 um, the, uh, what, the nine o'clock church, church service experience, they were more fired up than you were. You got about 20 minutes to change all that. <laughs> You're all like, oh, really, were they? Yeah, that's not good. You're like, oh, well, bless them. No, don't bless them. Be better than them. Here we go. <laughs> it's all about the competition. I'm just kidding. So he said, I'll give you the keys. If it's permitted in heaven, you can permit it on earth. If it's loosed in heaven, you can loose it on earth. Now, now, what's he talking about? Here's the question he dropped in my spirit. I, I'm actually out there in the field. I'm walking, I'm praying, trying to get ready for the weekend, clear my head, and, and God said, are we building the kingdom or are we building the church? I'm gonna say that question again, and that's when everyone goes, hmm, okay, let's just try it. Are we building the kingdom or are we building the church? That was a great question. A great question, and, and I stepped back and I said, we're gonna be determined to build the kingdom. And so let me unpack this for a moment, and I think you'll, you'll, you, you'll get where I want to go here. So I wrote a couple things down this morning, and then I kind of wrote a list of the difference between just church and kingdom. So I think I've laid the groundwork that the church is essential, right? It's the vehicle God is using to reach the world. So let me say a couple things. I've got I to read this because I just wrote this down a little bit ago. God's desire is to manifest his kingdom in you and through you. The desire of God is to manifest his kingdom to you and through you. 
We say, well, what do you mean by kingdom? Kingdom is the domain of God's authority. So let's reword that. God wants to manifest the dominion of his authority in your life and through your life. It's called the culture of the kingdom. Culture are the beliefs, it's the way you do life. What does God want to do? He wants to, didn't Jesus, the Bible said Jesus went around proclaiming the kingdom. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus brought the kingdom on earth. What is God calling us to do? Extend the kingdom on earth. He called people out, the ecclesia, to extend the kingdom. But you know what we've been doing in the church world? Train, it's like toothpaste trying to squeeze the kingdom into the church. Let me ask you a question. If the church disappeared, would we still have the kingdom? But if the kingdom disappeared, what would the church have? So a healthy church, a healthy Christ follower is a kingdom-minded follower. God has, God, 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 I don't know, I don't know where that can go. I got all English there for a second. God has called the church, God's called the church to, to extend his kingdom throughout the whole earth. It's the calling of the church to extend the kingdom. So I was speaking a moment ago about this thing of submission. Our position has to be one of submission to God and his authority. And here's why. This, this statement, you need to tweet, you need to write it down, you, you, you need to do something with this, this statement. Because I believe there, is, there can be a spirit of rebellion in the world. It can actually get in the church, too. It can get on us that, that we just need to be surrendered to God, submitted to the direction that God's going. And here's why. There is, I'll tell you what to write down in just a second. There, there are a lot of people in their life as believers, I believe, experiencing lower than what God wants them to have. Some of them are are experiencing uh, continual uh, poverty, continual sickness, constant um, depression and oppression, and sometimes it has to the fact that we are not getting ourselves submitted to the word of God and leadership and connected in in God's way of doing things, and it brings that spirit of of, of rebellion and and oppression, And, and I'm not saying anytime you get challenged with something, but sometimes it could be that way, so we have to understand how God does things. Authority can only be given by God, and he's given the church what? Authority. He's given us believers authority. Now, here's what I want you to write down. Authority always recognizes authority. So the Bible says that the devil has authority in this sphere of the earth. But how many know God's authority is greater? And his authority is in you, and it's in me. The devil, his authority has to respond to the authority of God. Authority always recognizes authority. A person in leadership always recognizes a person of higher rank in the military, for example. So authority, the devil's authority, always has to recognize the authority of a believer. Always has to recognize the. And the Bible said, I gave you the keys of the kingdom. The keys represent authority. If I gave you my my set of keys, that means you could go out to my car and you could open my car, start my car, drive my car home to my house, open my door, walk in my door, open my fridge, eat my food, it would give you permission. If I didn't give you the keys, which I'm not going to do, you could not do that. If you were in my car walking in my house, I would be like, hey, I know you go to my church and you're pretty cool, but you also broke into my house and stole my car. (laughs) But if I give you the keys, I would give you the authority to operate those things. It's what God has done. I give you the keys of the kingdom. If it is bound in heaven, then you bind it in your sphere of influence. See, the kingdom is to expand, it is to grow. And if God put this church, and if he put you in this community, doesn't matter what's going on in this community, how dark it is, how bleak it is, how, how much poverty there might be, how much health crisis there might be, how much addiction is challenging. We can, we can talk, oh, it's bad, it's bad, all oh, pastor, is bad. Yeah, but you're good. You've got the light. The light extends and conquers the darkness. We need to quit. I mean, we need to quit as the church talking about how bad it is, how bad, oh, who, how bad, and start saying the light of the gospel is in us. And where we walk, the authority of God walks. So, what's the difference between being kingdom minded and just church minded? You ready for my list? Here we go. First of all, here's the first difference. And you, you, don't, you can write these if you want, but are we focused on going to church or being the church? Wasn't that good? Are we focused on being the church 
or going to church. Well, we're, we're going to go to church on Sunday. We have, the church is our hospital. We've got to go in there and just huddle because it's dark out there. What church happens? You, you are church. The church isn't just a building from, what is this, 1030 to whatever this one is. They all run together after a while. The, you're, you're part of the kingdom. The same authority is in you Friday night at 9 o'clock as there is Sunday morning at 1045. So are we the church or are we going to church? How about this one? Is that, is it all about just Sunday morning? Or is it all about the 24-7 commitment to be a Christ follower? Y- y'all can act all Jesus in here. You know, it all bless you, bless you. And you can be out there saying something else. Kingdom-minded people have the same mindset. We just realize this. On Sunday morning, it's just an opportunity to come together and lock arms and worship together and get trained up and get pumped up to go back out there. This is a mountaintop experience, but how many know we often live in the valleys? I got a few more. You ready for these? How about this? This is a good one. Are we competing with the church across town or are we competing against the kingdom of darkness? Well, this church did that, but what are we called to do? Are we trying to outdo them, or are we in competition with the kingdom? of? Because if we're competing in with the church across town, we might take a look and find out that the kingdom of darkness may be whooping us in certain areas. How about this? Are we producing codependent church attenders, or are we producing real kingdom-minded disciples full of the love and power of God? See, my job is not to make you codependent on me. It's to make you codependent on God. It's to make you codependent on the word of God and the word of God working in your life. If you come up against something and I'm on vacation laying on the sands in Maui and you're like, Pastor, you gotta come home right now because I have a little situation going. No, you need to have something that I've trained you to rise up inside of you and say, I can speak to that. I can stand against that. I can conquer that. You know, a lot of churches, a lot of pastors are insecure and they want everyone to be codependent on them. But see, I need to make you codependent on the power of God. You need to, how to, you need to know how to speak the sickness. You need to know how to, how to claim your, your blessing. You need to know how to deal with the devil. Amen? I mean, what if me and all the pastors are on a pastor's retreat and we're, we're you know, we're, we're on, in Malibu somewhere just doing our vacation thing and you come up against something. Sounds like a good place to go. But you come up against something. I think that was God. We need to have a pastor's retreat. Someone, where's the secretary? Can you write that down? Anyway, so, but what if something comes up against you? What if it's deception? And you need to be codependent on the things of God, not a person. Oh, how about this one? Do we live in maintenance mode or are we fixated on the message of Christ and the mission of Christ? Because I've heard people say, well, the church is a hospital for broken people. Um, yeah, but it's a place where broken people come and they get fixed. We're not supposed to stay in a broken down position forever. God, God, God will come and fix you and solidify you and change you. And, and, and we need to be not fixated on just maintenance mode. But get, get obsessed with the mission of God. Because it takes our eyes off of... Hmm. Are we preaching Jesus or are we offering feel-good self-help principles? There's a lot of that going on. Are we equipping people to become kingdom responsible or are we just entitling people with religion? Are we building people or are we building an organization? Look at this one or this one. Are we facilitating consumers or are we launching influencers? See, we, we, we live in a culture that's very um, consumer oriented. Gimme, gimme, gimme. And sometimes we bring that into church. Pastor, I've had a rough week. I need a, I need a sermon that's at least a 9.4. I didn't, I didn't want to hear about forgiveness. I wanted to hear about dealing with that husband of mine. That's a 6.4. I need to go down the street somewhere else and get my, and we, we get consumer oriented. Instead of the Bible says every joint supplies, every joint brings, it brings influence. He, he, here's my last one. In your life, 
with this church, when it comes down to it, is, is it the kingdom's reputation that's on the line or your own? Think about this. The way you walk, the way you talk, the way you live your life, what if how you did, what if how you worshiped, what if how you walked, what if how you witnessed, what if the kingdom's reputation was on the line for the way you did Jesus, how you did following Christ? Not my reputation, but the kingdom's reputation. What about where I go, what I do, what I converse about, what I talk about at the coffee shop, at work, at, work, at school? What if the kingdom's reputation was on the line for I, how I walked? Let me read you one last scripture. Matthew chapter 13. Once again, Jesus talking, and Jesus said, I'm going to give you another parable, and he put forth to them, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is just like a mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his field. And indeed, it's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it grows, it's the greatest. It's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so all the birds, the birds of the air come and they nest in its branches. See, this kingdom seed may seem small, but the kingdom seed always returns and grows a harvest. The seed of the kingdom, the seed of the word, always creates a harvest. And do not neglect if it seems like it started small in your life. Do not neglect if you think it's minute in your life because it has the power to change everything. Another thing about that mustard seed, not only is it the smallest, but it is also a seed that cannot be cross-pollinated. In other words, it's pure, it's real, it's authentic, it works. Let's all stand. So what I want you to get this morning is this, is you need the right revelation to have the right confession because that's the confession you got to stand on. Within that confession, Jesus said, I'll build a church out of people who have the accurate revelation. And he says, and to them, I'm going to toss the keys of the kingdom. And my goal for you, for me, for this church is that we would be healthy and understand that it's about the kingdom of God not just our church. The church works through the kingdom. The kingdom's the power of the church. But what are we? What are you? Don't minimize the seed of the kingdom that's in you. Let me put it this way. Where you go, all of the authority of heaven goes. And there are some things in your life the devil has deceived you and lied to you and talked you into believing you think they're greater than, than, than the power of God in you, and they are not. The oppression, the depression, the lack, the sickness, the disease, the confusion, you've the devil's had us staring at the problem, and when we stare at the problem, it gets magnified. How about we stare at the solution, the kingdom that's in us, and let it get magnified? And you'd understand that where you go, all of heaven is delegated to go with you. And, and we can't be like, oh, Lord, if it would be thy will for this just to go. No, well, first of all, we understood, we learned this. The, the grace of God, no matter what you're going through, you've got the grace of God. And number two, we know this that you can't walk in authority and make suggestions. I'm going to say that again. You can't walk in authority and everything be a suggestion. There are times you got to say, because I said so. Are your kids like mine? You tell them something, why? It, like the best answer I have sometimes is, because I said so. The devil will do the same thing. I'm not saying the, your kids are like the devil. I'm just saying... The he'll try to be like, well, why? How come? Well, you deserve it. You don't need it. Sometimes you just got to look at the devil and say, because he said so, and he said so, I say so. That's why he said he gave you the keys. There are things we're permitting. He said, if it's permitted in heaven, then you permit it in your life. If it's bound in heaven, then you, you forbid it in your life. Is sickness forbid in heaven? 
How about we put some authority in the name of Jesus to those areas? Is poverty bound in heaven? You can bind it in your life. Is there depression in heaven? No. Then you can, you can forbid it in your life. Why? Because I've got kingdom authority. Is there addiction in heaven? No. Then you can forbid it in your sphere. Yeah. What I'm saying is the power of the kingdom is big enough for you in the sphere that you walk in. When you walk into work, there's a sphere of influence and the kingdom of God shows up with you. The thoughts that are tormenting you, the challenges that are coming against your mind, your heart, and your life, it's time to say, no, I'm going to forbid that. Because authority recognizes authority. That spirit that's coming against you has to recognize the authority that's in your life. It's scriptural. Anyone glad they came this morning? Amen. Amen. God called you to thrive, not just barely survive. Look at someone, elbow him, and say, he is talking to you. I'm going to say it again. He did not call you to barely survive. He called you to thrive. Well, how come this and how come that? Well, I'm just praying to God. There, there are times to stop praying and stop saying or start saying. Now, let me rephrase it. There are times to stop praying and start saying. God, do something about it. Do something about it. God might be saying, you do something because I gave you the keys. It'd be like if I gave you the keys, if I gave Mr. Steve the keys and, he, and, and, and say, go on in my house and I get home and he's just standing outside. Well, what are you doing? I'm just waiting. Waiting for God to open that door. Waiting for him to open that door. And when he opens that door, well, I'm going to go in shouting. He might be standing there a week later. I'm just waiting for God to open that door. Why are you standing there? I gave you the keys. Church, why are you standing there? I gave you the keys. <laughs> Followers, why are you standing there? I gave you the keys. Father, I thank you for our crowd.